Ray GUI is a simple and easy to use immediate mode GUI library. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at all of the controls that Ray GUI has to offer. There are many different implementations of immediate mode GUI, but in this video, we're taking a look at the light made for Raylib Ray GUI. You will see in my example that I've written some code to manage a very basic layout system, but Generally speaking with UI, you're going to want to have something that's actually curated and designed before the game is run. And so in those cases, something like our GUI layout will be very helpful. But how are you going to make a decision on which style you're going to use when you're not even sure how to use Ray GUI? At the top of your C file, where you likely have all of your include statements, you'll want to include a define Ray GUI implementation before this include statement. If you don't include this anywhere in your project, then the linker won't know where to find any function definitions for anything included in RayGUI. If you include it in more than one file, then you will have a linking conflict because you will have two definitions or more. The interface for RayGUI's controls is very simple. There is an integer return value, the meaning of which will change depending on the function. The first parameter specifies the bounds as a rectangle. Often the second parameter is a title or label of the element. And then depending on the functionality of what's being used, the other parameters will be something different. For example, GUI toggle, which functions as a button which can be toggled on and off, takes a pointer to a bool which controls the active state of the button. In the case of this function, it will return one on the frames that it has clicked, but it will also be storing the state in here. So you can either monitor the return of this function or monitor this bool for changes. In the case for other controls where very little state is needed, for instance, the GUI button, which only needs to return one on frames when it's been clicked and can return zero otherwise, the signature is very simple. Most of the functionality of many of these controls can be easily inferred just by reading the name and the comment. But I find the best way to understand the different controls of Ray GUI is to throw them into a sandbox. The first set of controls that we will look at are the container slash separator controls. The window box is a perfect base for something like a modal pop-up. You want to have a message and some buttons for the user, but you want to draw your own custom content inside of that box. This is a great starting point. It returns zero on all frames, except on the frame that the X is clicked when it returns one. Next, we have a group box. This is just a nice little outline with a label. So if you have a bunch of different buttons, you can group them up in here or really any sort of controls. Along the similar vein to the group box is this line separator. Same thing, except instead of being a box, it's more for a list. Panel is very similar to window box, except it doesn't necessarily have the X control built into it. The tab bar has limited functionality, at least to me. The tab width is hard coded. There's nothing you can do to change it. I mean, short of modifying the source itself, but that gives it very limited utility in my eyes. As for the scroll panel, it's quite usable. Right now I have it set up to have a vertical bar only, so I've actually disabled the horizontal bar. And you can see as I scroll it, we're scrolling uh, this texture that I'm drawing. This next section I'm calling buttons and toggles because that's really what we're looking at. But the first element is not a button or a toggle, it's just a label. Right below the label, we have the button. This is probably one of the most useful elements and it's also one of the simplest. In this case, I have it wired up to randomly pick a new background color. The next one is a label button. It's all the functionality of a button and all of the aesthetics of the label. So, I mean, if you need something kind of discreet or if you can imagine it's almost like hyperlink text, uh, then we have this label button option here. Next is GUI toggle, which is a button that can be toggled on and off. This is the first control that you'll see that actually has a state that you need to pass in as a pointer. The toggle group is our first control that allows us to pick an item from a list. It's also the first control that has a bit of an unexpected definition for how the bounds should be used. For all of these other options, the bounds are the size of the control itself. For the labels, I'm drawing them as 10 high and the buttons are 200 by 80. In the case of this toggle group, however, I need to specify the size of only a single button. In addition, this padding here is not something that's provided as a parameter. It's not super convenient. After that is toggle slider. It kind of looks like you can click and drag, but really it's just a click. Could still be useful if you want to provide a user a choice among a set of options that exist on a spectrum. Though in my opinion, the best toggle group out of all three of these is actually the combo box. It's inlined as being a single element, so it doesn't stretch unexpectedly like the first one and doesn't have kind of a confusing interaction like the second. It lists how many options you have despite being inlined, and it has plenty of room for the name of the item that you've selected. The last couple controls that I have on the screen here are the checkbox, which is like the toggle and functionally I have them using the same value and the bounds specify the size of this box here. And the last control that I have here is this drop down box. Now this is also a bit of a funny one. The bounds tell you how big the box should be and how big one of the entries will be 
when I click on it. You will need to carefully monitor the state of the Dropbox to see whether it's open or closed, because if you have any elements that are supposed to be behind what this pop-up is, they're gonna appear on top. These are the kinds of things that I've always found to be an issue with the drop-down box. Something else that's worth mentioning, because it might seem a bit unintuitive to some, is that if the drop-down box is positioned near the bottom of the window, then some of the options are not gonna be visible. These are all about getting a specific value from the user. The first one we have here is a spinner. This allows you to click on the different arrows to scroll through the possible values, as well as click into the field and actually enter a number. Right now I have it set to work between zero and 10. It'll allow me to type in something like a thousand, but when I click away or hit enter, it's gonna snap to the range that I've specified. The spinner is implemented partially using the value box, which you can also use directly without the extra buttons on the sides. This third option is value box float, which works a little bit more like a regular text entry field, except that it's possible to get a float value as a result. So I can type in a float value here and I'll be able to get a float value directly out of this. But it's also just a regular text field and it's not necessarily preventing me from putting extra decimals. It is preventing me from typing letters. This next one is the text box option. So this one we can type whatever we like. It allows funny characters. And these two down here are sliders. We have the slider and slider bar. The difference being whether or not it shows as a simple handle floating in an empty bar, or if it's a bar that fills like a progress bar. On the subject of progress bars, there is also one called progress bar. This one has a slightly different style to the other two, and it's actually not interactable. We have three more basic controls to talk about, and those are the dummy rec, the grid, and the status bar. The grid control is pretty neat. It may have saved me a bit of a headache when I was building my Minesweeper project. The grid will tell you which cell the mouse is in, which is quite helpful. I'm actually showing the status bar at the bottom here, and we can see which coordinate my mouse is in. We also have this dummy rec here, which is truly just a rectangle with a label. The last few controls I wanna look at here are considered advanced controls, and that's because, well, you'll see, they have a lot of options. First one is the GUI message box. So this is kind of like a finished example of what you might do with the window box from the beginning. This is great because if all you need is a simple modal pop-up with a couple of options, you can skip needing to build it yourself using the window box and some of the other elements. Rectangle bounds and title is something we've already talked about. Then we have message, which is of course the text that's in the middle here. And then we have the buttons option, which is gonna be a single string that contains every option, but each individual option should be separated by a new line character. Unlike many of the other controls, this one returns negative one on most frames. And when it returns zero, it actually means that the X has been clicked. And if it returns any positive number, then it's returning the index of which button was pressed. This one is the text input box. The main difference between this and the message box is the ability to have a text field. So this would be good if you're having the user type in a password or a license key, something like that. Next, we have list view and list view X. And similar to some of the other group controls that we saw, it's really just a list of strings. And whichever one that we click on, it's gonna be controlling an int that tells you which index has been selected. The only major difference that I could see between this list view and list view X is that list view X provides support for reporting which item is actually being hovered. I could see that being useful if you have some kind of render over here you know, for instance, it's a shirt or something like that for your character. And as you're scrolling through these, you want to see an immediate preview. The other major difference is that this one up here is one of those very long string with many new lines to separate the options, where the second one will actually point to an array of strings. And the last option is the color picker. Now the color picker actually comes in multiple pieces. The GUI color picker is kind of the catch all one here. So it shows the saturation and value on the left and then we have a hue slider. If you look at the implementation for this function, it's really just calling color panel and color bar hue. If you also need alpha control, then you can add this alongside your color picker. And if it's more convenient for you to get the values in HSV rather than RGB, then you can use this color picker HSV and color panel HSV instead. And as far as reviewing the Ray GUI controls, that's it. Even this demo that I created for the video, I also was using Ray GUI to control all of my controls for it. So each of these options will actually determine which options should show on screen. And then I have a number of functions here that allows me to immediately return rectangles for different sized elements, and it will actually maintain the layout across them.
Despite my better judgment, I am going to provide the source for this project, so if you wanted to check out how I did some of the debug stuff, none of it's perfect, and I'm not going to lie, there is some macro garbage here. If you're just looking to try out some of the different Ray GUI controls, or if you want to check out some of the different styles or custom styles that you're working on, this might be a good place to try that. I intend to make follow-up videos where we talk more about the uses of Ray GUI and some of its other features. Let me know in the comments if there's anything specific you want me to see do with Ray GUI or with Raylib in general. Thanks for watching.